In the course of human evolution, societies have used countless different things as money. Is it possible that what a society chooses as its money can affect the behavior of its people? The classical, the conventional way of thinking about money is that it's a passive medium of exchange that is being used as a convenience to make exchanges between people and that it doesn't really affect either the kind of transactions that are being performed, it just makes them easier, uh, or the relationships between the people that are using that kind of money. Both these things happen to be proven wrong. Different kinds of money do have very different properties. And one of the key properties is the level of abundance or scarcity of the item that's being used as money. If it's abundant, you will get a proliferation of trade. People will be able to exchange their goods and services fairly freely. If money is scarce, you create a very serious problem because you prevent people from actually being able to exchange goods and services. Most people have no idea where money comes from. A lot of people believe that it's the governments that create the money. Conventional money is not created by the government, as many people believe, and is not even created by the central banks, or do they do part of it. But it is actually created by the banking system. People see these films about the uh, U.S. Mint and the government printing office, and they see these sheets of dollar bills being run off the printing presses. And so they think it's the government that's printing money. But this is not uh, the real source of money. The real source of money is banks. The banks have a complete monopoly on the money creation process. So the public are not actually involved in it at all, directly or indirectly. The Federal Reserve is a private institution owned by commercial banks who are uh, members of the Federal Reserve System, which includes all the nationally chartered banks. Most people don't realize that the Federal Reserve is a private corporation and is for profit. And in fact, Federal Reserve, it's neither federal and it's not a reserve. In 1910, a group of top American bankers met on Georgia's Jekyll Island to discuss ways of stabilizing the country's banking system. Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, giving this private corporation a monopoly over issuing the nation's money supply. How then did the power to issue something as fundamental as money fall into private hands? Initially, you can think a bank was about storing people's gold. So you come in, you, get, you store your gold at the bank, and the banker gives you a gold certificate and says, you have such and such amount of gold in my bank. Now, the basis of the paper money systems was when you could start trading those pieces of paper. Let's say you have some gold that you want to keep safe. You put it in a bank, and the bank gives you a paper receipt you can redeem later for your gold. You can now trade that piece of paper in place of the gold, as long as others are also able to redeem it for your gold. The good name of the bank on the paper note assures people that behind the piece of paper is a piece of gold waiting to be redeemed. Soon, as the people's confidence in the bank grows, rather than cashing in the receipt, the person receiving the paper simply trades it again. The paper may end up being traded many times before being redeemed for the original gold in the bank. And banks discovered that when people started paying each other with claims to the coins in the bank's vault, rather than taking the coins out, that the bank didn't really need to keep all the coins in the vault in order to have enough to actually pay people who did come and want the coins. The banker realizes nobody's coming to take the gold. Gold's just sitting there. So instead of just putting out one piece of paper that says, you know, there's such and such amount of gold, you can put out a lot of pieces of paper given the fact that nobody is coming and taking the gold. And you can lend money. And the basis of that loan is the trust that people have that if they want to come and get the gold, the gold will be there. The only thing that makes that system work is the fact that nobody actually does come to get the gold. Now, if everybody said, you know what, I'm going to go get my gold at the bank. If everybody went and got it, there wouldn't be enough gold for everybody. Uh, you often had bank runs and bank panics. When people would have a, uh, 
a lack of confidence in a particular bank, they would take those bank notes to the bank and demand their gold and silver. And with fractional reserves, um, that bank would quickly run out of the reserve metal and have to close its doors. The reason the bank did it is because they're making money off of earning interest, off of those loans that were promises that there was gold in the bank. As people's confidence in the bank and its receipts continues to grow, banks soon discover an unexpected way to earn profit. A bank can print a receipt for gold that does not even exist. They can then loan that receipt to someone on the condition that they pay it back with interest. While the bank takes a risk by having less gold than the outstanding receipts, there is an almost unlimited potential to make profit off charging interest on loaning gold it does not even have. If people catch on that there isn't enough gold to redeem their receipts, they will all go to the bank at once to get their gold. If this happens, there will be a bank run. The bank will fail because it is caught without enough gold to back up its receipts. In 1934, in an attempt to prevent further bank failures, a series of banking reforms slowly took away people's ability to trade their paper money in for gold or silver. In 1971, Richard Nixon removed the last vestiges of this convertibility. Today, our money can no longer be redeemed for gold or silver. Now we've gone beyond that to what I think of as, as an even more postmodern reality, which is we don't even see the money anymore. We don't hold it in our hands. We take a piece of plastic to the supermarket, buy groceries, and run it through a machine which, which registers it in our account book somewhere. The, the buyer, the seller, doesn't see it either, right? And at the, end, at the end of the day, they balance accounts, and some numbers have been added to the, to the supermarkets and taken out of ours account. Most of the assets that we call money are not printed dollar bills. In fact, the currency is a very small proportion of the total amount of money. Most of what we call money are bank accounts. In the same way that banks used to issue more paper money than they had gold, today banks issue more bank account money than they have cash reserves. It is these bank account balances that make up about 97% of what we think of as money. If a landlord wants to know how much money you have before you sign a lease, you would show them an account balance and not a suitcase full of cash. Another misconception that people have about money is that money is a thing. But in today's world, money is simply credit, which means it's an information system. And the question is, what kind of information does it convey? It's information about claims against the economic output. So if money is nothing more than information about what we owe each other, how does the money we use every day get created? Money is created through a process of bank loans. People, companies, governments going to the banking system and borrowing money. So every dollar, every national currency you've ever seen is someone's debt. For every new dollar created in the monetary system, you have a corresponding debt. That works both for the Federal Reserve dollars themselves and for the bank deposit dollars that are based on them. Money is issued whenever someone takes out a loan from the bank. So if I walk into a bank and I want to borrow half a million dollars to start a business and I've got a good business plan and I've got customers, then the bank, assuming they agree, will give me half a million dollars to start my business. Now, most people, if you ask them, will say, well, that half a million dollars comes from somewhere else. It comes from someone else's savings. It comes from investments. That's actually not true. When I say money is issued as debt, I mean they don't get that money from anywhere. They actually create it out of thin air and create a credit in my bank account and poof, there it is. John Kenneth Galbraith in his book, Money, Once It Came, Where It Went, says this. He says, 
The process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. And it's true. When I tell people how money is created by banks simply by making ledger entries, uh, they just can't believe it. The private banking system literally creates our money out of nothing and loans it into the economy. The only way new money can get into the economy and ultimately your pocket is via a bank loan. This means that every dollar you have ever seen is someone's debt to a bank. The simple fact is, and it's very, it's an uncomfortable fact for many people to realize that if all the debts were repaid, then all the money supply would simply disappear. There would be no money. And that would mean a complete and total collapse of the economy. The catch is that they want more repaid than what they've given me. When you go to a bank and borrow $100,000 to buy a house, uh, they will check whether you are good credit. And uh, then they will decide to create the money, entering it electronically in your account and say you have to bring back $200,000 in the next 20 years. The $100,000 of the first loan is created. The second one, the interest rate, is not created. So they send you in the world, compete with everybody else, to bring in the second $100,000. That's how the money is kept scarce. It is through the competition between the different players for interest that is not created. So there's always less money than is necessary, okay? And it's done systemically. If you go to a bank and you borrow money in the circulation, if the bank decides to approve your loan application, they will make two entries on their books. One is they will take your note, let's say it's a mortgage note, and that will be an asset on the books of the bank, and they will offset that with an equal deposit to your account which is a liability on the books of the bank. So the money creation process is as simple as that. But the bank does not create the interest that you're going to have to pay year by year by year uh, until this mortgage loan matures. So where does that interest come from? Where does the interest come from? <laughs> I have to find that. Well, it has to come from some other loan that was made to someone else. So you have this uh, inherent deficiency in the money supply. Not everyone can repay what they owe to the banks. At any given time there is more owed to the banks than exists in circulation. Which means inevitably someone is going to lose the game. Someone is going to go bankrupt and that has nothing whatsoever to do with the quality of the goods and services or the efficiency of the business. Nothing at all. It's like a game of musical chairs. It assures that there must be some losers, regardless of how competent they are in conducting their business. The money we get when we receive a loan is called principal. Our debt, however, is not discharged when we repay the principal. Bank loans are all made on the condition that people pay both the principal and the interest the bank charges. However, money can only be issued as principal. No one creates the interest, so the amount of debt owed is actually far greater than the amount of money there is to repay it. When a dollar is loaned into the economy, it begins a loop. Joe the farmer gets a loan from the bank and pays Tom for fixing his tractor. Tom pays Jane for bread at the local bakery, and Jane in turn buys the wheat from Joe, who can now repay the loan. The problem is, Joe owes the bank interest on top of the principal. In order to avoid losing his property to the bank, Joe must go find other money making its own loop in the economy. He can now repay his loan with the interest, but the people in that loop are left without their money. They still need money to facilitate their exchanges, and to repay the loan that issued the money they had been using. The only place they can get it is from other such debt loops. Since all money has an interest price tag attached, there will never be enough money to repay all the debt owed to banks. Therefore, some people will always have to go bankrupt or have their property repossessed by the bank. <laughs>